we talks online are feel like uh, shouting into the void. So if a few of you would like to be featured friends uh, like me, we'll keep our cameras and if possible, our audio on so that David can get some informal feedback so it doesn't feel like he's shouting into the nothingness. Um, you're welcome and encouraged to engage in the chat. I will monitor the chat and anything that needs to get amplified out loud can, although it's up to David whether or not he wants lots of interjections or not. Um, and I'll throw it to Tien to do to actually get us started with an introduction. Hi everyone, welcome back to Talk Math with Your Friends. Our speaker today is Dr. David Paxkel. Dr. Paxkel is a soon-to-be associate professor at Clayton State <laughs> University. <laughs> He's sponsored by the Cubicle, a society that supports Qbirds, as well as the Shelby Slappy Clayton State Cubic Society, or CSQ, which is also funded by Tensor Sumograt. He's very passionate about cubing, so consider inviting him to any math clubs or organization talks. And could everyone please join me in welcoming Dr. Paxwell. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me here. And I appreciate everyone who's taken time out of um, a, a nice Thursday afternoon to, to be with us here. Yeah, so I see Kate is already holding up a um, her physical Rubik's Cube. If you've got one, hold it up. That's great. That's awesome. Ooh, I see a signed cube there. Matthew, is that who signed it? Um, Aaron or Rubik. Oh, Rubik got yours. Okay, wonderful. Nice. Um, when did you have a chance to meet him? Uh, 2010 in Budapest. Oh, nice. In his homeland. That's wonderful. Um, as you'll see in a second, I've, I also had a chance uh, to meet him on one occasion. Um, hey, Araya, good to see you. Hey, Hannah. Some of my students, oh, uh, Arian made it too. It's good to see some Clayton State Lakers in the room. Um, I was uh, excited to be able to share this um, talk with them as well. Um, so if you don't have a physical cube, that's perfectly fine. Okay, I'm gonna put a link in the chat right now. Um, this link is to my personal web page. Oh, thanks, Kate. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just share my screen with you and just give you a, a look at what the, the web page is showing. So uh, there's only a few links on here right now. I um, fully intend to put links to this talk. Uh, so get meta on it uh, up on this page as well later, as well as like other resources as folks ask for them if I find stuff useful. Um, but there's three links right now that I think are super helpful. First is a link to the Google Drive with the slides for this talk, including the slides that we'll be using in the breakout room. Um, so if you just go ahead and navigate to the Google Drive, you can open up your own copy of the talk. I'll be projecting it on my shared screen as well as manipulating my copy that's on my computer. So it'll, it'll get updated and I will put the post talk slides on the website as well uh, and in this Google and Drive. We need to do permission, David. Oh dear, um, to the drive? Yes. Oh if goodness. You click the down arrow next to that folder name, Plaxo Cubes down arrow, oh, share. Great. And then everyone with the link. Right here? Yeah, I think that'll do it. Yep, that fixes Vic it. Victory. Okay, sorry about that. I. Uh, just presumed it would be <laughs> be open. Um, sorry, that's my naivete coming out. Okay, so um, so yeah, so the the slides for the breakout room are also in here. You don't need to open those quite yet. It'll maybe spoil a little bit of where we're headed. Um, but uh, just I just wanted you to have access to those uh, when the time came. Brian, you mentioned that like someone can be working on setting up breakout rooms uh, in the meantime. Max eight yep. is what I planned for. Um, and we don't, we won't need them for probably about 20 minutes. So, um, so yeah, so that's the first uh, resource on the web page is the link to the Google Drive. The second resource, and this is more important if you, if you don't have a physical cube, but also if you do, um, because I will be using the online simulator today as like a demonstration. Um, and it's also super helpful. I found working with students um, when you're communicating 
by using letters to talk about layer moves uh, on the cube. Um, the simulator kind of like fixes that for everybody. Everyone's orientation is the same. And all you have to do is punch in the, the letters from a sequence of moves on your keyboard. We'll talk more about that in a second too. Um, and that will manipulate the cube for you. So I just click on that second link and I'll show you a secret. Uh, there's a lot of ads on this web. It's a great resource, but it is like, I think kept up by ads. Um, but if you just change the width of the window until it pops, uh, then you just get the cube and you don't have the ads on either side. So if you want to make that adjustment, it's I find it makes my experience much more pleasant on this cube simulator. So, um, so I'm going to keep this on my um, desktop here. And um, then the, the last link here is a solver. Um, so this is a very useful resource if you do have a physical cube and you get lost along the way. Um, you, it, now it's kind of time, time consuming, uh, but you can just click on these stickers on the cube and it changes their color until you click until it matches the stickers on your own cube. And then you hit solve and it will tell you a sequence of moves and actually show you it on a digital cube. Um, uh, your cube getting solved back to all solid colors, which is helpful for like the approach that we're going to be taking today in um, identifying what uh, sequences of moves are actually doing to um, a solved cube. So let me bring the chat back up for myself. Um, let's see here. Yes, the um, the Ruix website is a is a wonderful, wonderful place, uh, wonderful resource to have. I'm really grateful to whoever has built that. I'm not sure like who all is behind it, but it's a good resource. Um, okay, sorry. It, look, it seems like I've addressed most of the issues um, mm -hmm. with sharing the folder and stuff. Okay, so as uh, Tian mentioned. Um, I am um, at Clayton State University, where uh, I'm currently like I'm the just starting out with the Clay, uh, the Shelby Slappy Clayton State Cubing Society, which is a, a, a cubing club that I've started this year with help from the MAA um, as well as the Cubicle. Um, super grateful to both of them for supporting like all of my cubing stuff over the past few years. The Cubicle has been really nice as a sponsor. Um, and, uh, and they also have like pretty decent uh, resources. If you want to check them out, sorry, that's like my, that's not my advertisement for the day, okay? <laughs> um, so yeah, um, first off, let's meet the Rubik's Cube. I'm sure you're probably already familiar. It was invented in the late seventies. That's uh, it's like the, mo the first thing you ever hear when you um, hear anything about the Rubik's Cube. It became incredibly popular in the 80s and then not so popular for a while and then really popular again. Um, in fact, there's an international organization now called the World uh, Cubing Association, Cubers Association, um, that like is kind of like manages all like international cubing stuff, like records and everything like that, standards. Um, so I started personally, I, I purchased my first cube in January 2017. Um, I was, I decided I was going to like learn to solve it all on my own and, you know, like show off my math chops 30 minutes in, I was so frustrated. I was like, uh, Google how to solve a Rubik's cube. And then later that day I had solved it back and felt fine for it. I didn't feel any worse for it. So there's no shame in actually like looking up solutions. Um, but what I, what I realized was like, I wasn't wild about the, like the approaches that the solutions take. Uh, but I didn't have a good alternative. So I've been working on that for the past few years. And that's like part of what I want to share with you today. Um, so the uh, a physical, uh, the, the Rubik's Cube can be thought of as a physical instantiation of a non-commutative group. This order is like 43 quintillion, I think is the appropriate, like it's big. There's a lot of scrambles here. But the crazy thing is that um, no two scrambles are more than 20 moves apart from each other, which seems completely counterintuitive, but um, there's a lot of generators in this group. And so um, there's shortcuts between any two scrambles. Um, so on the left here, you can see where my partner, Amy Ellis and I met Erno Rubik back in 2018. He was here in Atlanta for the Gathering for Gardner conference. Um, he was a very nice soft-spoken gentleman, um, very patient signing all of my cubes. <laughs> and um, 
And he put on a few good talks as well. He gave some good interviews and stuff. Um, also, like I mentioned, the cubing being really popular nowadays. If you want to just see, like, get an insight into the world of how, like, the subculture of like how popular Rubik's cube are right now. Rubik's cubes are right now on Netflix. You can stream a short documentary. It's about forty minutes called The Speed Cubers. It centers around a relationship between Max Park, who's the the young man in the uh, in the poster here, and um, an Australian man named uh, Felix Zemdegs, both of whom are world-class cubers, speed cubers. Um, it also features a lot of folks who have like in my, in the past few years, like become like familiar with like, oh, there's, you know, like there's uh, Kit uh, and there's, I don't know, like you see all these uh, popular, like, or popular cubers <laughs> in the documentary. So it's pretty cool. I highly recommend it. I, I, I only cried twice while watching it, so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Kate, I agree. Uh, yeah, you cubers, that's. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, Brian, not that number factorial, but just that number. <laughs> um, yeah, Matthew, uh, good point. The the diameter of the of the Kaylee uh, diagram for the for the Rubik's cube is 26 if you use the quarter turn me metric. So I guess it requires six. Um, half turns at least for any scramble uh, and which would be counted as two quarter turns if you're, if you're only counting quarter turns. So fair point. Um, okay, so, um, oh, sorry, let me back up. Uh, so cubes are like ogres. They have many layers. Um, sorry, I could not resist with that joke, uh, but they do. They have, uh, the, the way that we tend to communicate about um, moves on our cubes is by communicating about the layers. So um, in this talk today, uh, to be consistent with this online virtual cube, I'm gonna think of the orange stickers as being on top of the cube and the white stickers as being toward the front of the cube. That positions the blue stickers to the right side and the green stickers to the left. We'll get a little bit more into that. Um, so there's the front stickers. Opposite that front layer is the back layer. Um, and so you might notice that the front is white stickers, the back is yellow stickers. Th that's always true for any um, like standard colored Rubik's cube. White's gonna be opposite yellow. Um, the, um, the left side today is gonna be the green stickers and the right side is going to be the blue stickers. Those two are always opposite each other as well. And then um, yeah, uh, orange is gonna be on top and that means red, it's opposite color is gonna be on bottom. So we denote each of those layers by U and B respectively, um, because, uh, or sorry, U and D, I'm sorry. B is for the back, D is for down. Even I confuse that. Uh, and then there, there's two more layers that are super helpful when communicating algorithms, the meridian and uh, the equator. Now on the virtual cube website, um, in order to twist any of these layers, all you need to do is hit that letter the, of the first, the first letter of the word that describes that layer, but it is case sensitive. And the reason is, let's just, let's just see what happens when, when I do capital E for equator. We see that the blue stickers come around to the, the white face, but if I don't hold down shift, I'm gonna not hold down shift and just hit the E button, it swipes it back in the opposite direction. So it's case sensitive and the capital letters are gonna move one direction and lowercase letters are gonna move in the other direction. Um, and we can go ahead and so if I, if I hit capital U for up, it's gonna spin that one to where the blue stickers come around to the, the front. I'm gonna hit it again. So this is all capital letters up. And if I hit lowercase U, it goes in the opposite direction. Um, and the, generally the way to think about this, especially for the outside layers is if you're facing that layer, the capital letter or what we're, go we're, we're gonna call a positive direction is gonna be clockwise and the lowercase letter on the simulator or the negative direction is gonna be counterclockwise. So, um, so this is a diagram of which direction is positive. It's not really that easy to make. It's kind of hard to communicate this. It's better to see it actually in action. Um, so yeah, so L um, is gonna be the positive direction. And we're gonna denote the reverse direction, that negative direction as L prime with just this little apostrophe. Group theorists just think it's the inverse. This is the minus one exponent. Instead, they use this, um, this apostrophe. This notation was developed in the early eighties by David Singmaster, uh, who was the first person to really like do a deep dive on the group theory. 
um, involved in uh, solving the Rubik's Cube. Um, so each layer can turn four times until it returns to where it started. They all have order four is another way to think about that. And so accordingly, M prime is the same as doing M three times and R2 is its own inverse. It has order. Like if you do, um, R2 is the notation for a half turn. Um, Matthew alluded to the half turn metric versus the quarter turn metric a second ago. So I use the half turn metric. Um, and so I'll use R2. And that just means it's a half 180 degree twist instead of a 90 degree clockwise twist of that layer. Okay. And if ever you're in doubt, just go to the um, just go to the, the simulator and hit hold down shift and hit whatever letter corresponds with the layer that you want to see move. So meridian will move that middle slice there uh, down. Some uh, from Math Twitter might call this a sandwich now. I don't know. <laughs> right. So um, is there so a move missing? I'm sorry. Like, I should, it, uh, I'm just, this is the first time I'm thinking about this, but shouldn't there be two different meridians? I mean, I bet you could accomplish one, but it's not a built-in move. Yeah, so there's, it's, it's actually, there is another one, it's called hook. Um, I, oh, no, I'm sorry. They call it a slice on here, I think. Yeah, slice. Uh, so that goes, so okay. there's X, Y, and Z on those middle slice. So um, the equator is kind of like that horizontal one. Vertical and, and pointing straight at us is uh, the meridian. And then slice is the one that's kind of like flat at us. I, I never use the slice when I'm communicating algorithms, so I didn't include them in this talk. But yeah, good call, Brian. Good, good, good eye too. All right. So on your keyboard, it's S or uh, you know capital S or lowercase S. We'll we'll do that later. And you might also think like, oh, well, this is equivalent to just twisting the other two layers in the opposite direction, and then turning the whole cube over. That's also true. <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways to notate. If you some notations will include X, Y, and Z for rotations of the physical cube. That changes your orientation. I don't want to do that today, so let's not mess with that. Um, yes, column. Good to see you. Uh, yes, yeah, Singmaster is alive and well. And he was also at that Gathering for Gardener meeting back in 2018. I have a, a selfie with him as well. Um, and in that selfie, he's got a sticker of the Cuban and Cube on his name tag, which I loved. Um, Okay, so um, so what does a layer twist actually do? Uh, we can think about any layer move as a permutation of cubies. Yes, cubies is the name that we use for each of those individual little cubes on the bigger cube that, com that comprise the bigger cube. So, um, so we just think about any layer move as a permutation of these cubies. So uh, these cubies have a type. Uh, there's centers, corners, and edges. Let me repeat this video a little bit just so we can see them in action. So um, centers are the cubies with exactly one sticker on them. They're in the middle of each face. Centers are going to map to centers. Edges are the cubies with two stickers on them. They're going to map to edges. And corners are the cubies with three stickers on them. They're on the corners of the cube. They're going to map to other corners. So it's important to distinguish between uh, the cubie itself, like the piece that occupies a position, and the position that it occupies. So uh, we'll see like kind of this distinction play out as we start to talk about algorithms. Um, the cubies are going to permute from one position to another position. And so we'll need to kind of recognize that, that, they're, that the, the pieces themselves are moving, the positions that they're moving into correspond to where other pieces began and stuff like that. So uh, I just want to prime you to start thinking the distinction between the cubie and the position that it's occupying. All right, and it's super helpful. Let me make this a little bit bigger in case you can't see this. It's super helpful um, to label the pieces so that you can track their movement. So if we're gonna like, like list of, like if we're gonna do a bunch of layer twists on a cube, um, we can track the movement of which permutation happened if we've labeled all the pieces on this. So I've adopted this. This is a very recent development that, <laughs> that I made while teaching some students uh, in, a, in a topics class here at Clayton State. Um, so uh, I've adopted this kind of like labeling uh, system for the stickers uh, on, the, on the pieces, on the cubies, the cubes. So you see the centers are on the far left. There's six of them. There's up, down, left, right, front, and back. So I just labeled them with capital letters that 
tell me where, which face they're on. There's the edge pieces. I've used numbers to, um, to label those. And each edge piece has two stickers. So I've put two copies of the same number on each edge piece. So say the orange and blue um, edge piece is uh, what I'm just calling that edge piece number two. Uh, and then the orange and yellow edge piece is edge piece number three. And then the corners, I've put three little copies of lowercase letters on the corners to let us denote and label those corner pieces. All right, so let's see. Um, let's see a layered twist actually like in action, right? What like what's it actually doing? So if we twist this equator layer a quarter turn um, as we're looking at it to the, oops, sorry. I'm trying to get it to where I can notate this, but it is not allowing me. I think I need to go to, uh -oh. start over. Yeah, I'll just do it on here. Okay, so if we're gonna twist this equator layer um, here to the left, as we're looking at it, this, um, this sticker right here in the front is gonna come around to the left-hand side. And then that left sticker is gonna go around back and back is gonna come over to the right and right is gonna come up here to the front. And so we can actually um, use these arrows here to convey that permutation. So the front, instead of going to the front, no, like staying in the front, it's going to go to the left position. The left cube, uh, sticker is going to go, or center sticker is going to go to the back position. Back comes around to right. And right goes all the way back around the front. And so we can see the, the four cycle playing out with those different arrows. Does that, does that make sense? Um, I see Brian nodding. Um, so yeah, so that's how we're going to indicate a permutation among each of these subsets of, of QBs. So um, uh, also at the same time as the centers are moving around the cube, the, um, the edge pieces on that equator layer are also moving. So five is going to go over here to eight. Eight's going around to seven here. Uh, seven's going to six. Sorry, that just blends in with those stickers there. And six is coming around to five. So I can make that change here. So five is going to eight. Eight is going to seven. Seven's going to, sorry. Seven's going to six. And six is going to five. All right, and the equator slice like that that layer doesn't affect either of the corners or any of the pieces on the up or down layers right it's only affecting the equator layers so these are the only cubies that are permuted um by that layer move all right so let's see another one uh here's the front that's the one that white face that's facing toward us toward us and a positive move is in the clockwise direction um so take a second and try to try to um See if you can figure out which pieces are going to move where, like which pieces are affected and where they're going to go. And feel free to unmute when you feel like you, you got a sense of what I need to do on here. Is it another pair of four cycles, but now edges and corners? Yeah, it is. And which edges are affected? Uh, one, five, nine, eight. Yeah, and that's your cycle too, right? Like one goes to yeah. five. Yeah. Five goes to nine. 
you said eight yeah and then eight goes to one one nice and, and a e h d a e h d and d goes back to a nice oh that one's like really symmetric that's cool Cool. Wonderful. Okay. So um, thanks, Brian. That was awesome. And all the centers are um, are left in the same spot. I guess, though, I did, I did build these little guys down here um, in case somebody gets twisted a little bit, right? Uh, and it turns out, like, you know, that front layer, like, the white sticker is still in the same place, but it did get twisted 90 degrees. So we could, if we wanted to, we could just bring this 90 degree twist and put that on the F. So it stayed in place, but it we can indicate that it's twisted 90 degrees clockwise using um, using that little sticker right there if we want. Right. So, so this is so we care yeah. about that. Um, on the on the center stickers on a three by three, no, right? Like uh, there are versions of three by three puzzles where you would hold on, I'll grab one. Um, so here's one that's a, this is effectively a three by three cube, but it's a, um, a pipe puzzle, right? So you wanna be able to put a BB in here and it roll around all these pipes and come out here. Well, this, this pipe piece right here, if that's turned 90 degrees, that's pretty important, yeah? So um, generally no on a three by three, but sometimes, yeah. And when you get into larger n by n cubes, definitely. Um, if you're putting a pattern on an n by n cube, uh, you might turn a pattern sideways. Um, so yeah, there's a 90 degree turn there. It's not as important on the centers. On the three by three, on the edges and the corners, it's going to be critical. If something gets mapped to itself, it might get twisted or flipped upside down. And it's important to be able to denote that. So that's why I included, that's why I wanted to bring it up now. Yeah. Good question. All right, so what about F prime? Taking that same face and turning it counterclockwise. Just flip your picture upside, your arrow picture upside down. <laughs> yeah, good point. So we can take these arrows right here from before. I'm going to group those together. Um, how do I hide this thing? And, and bring them back here, paste them, and flip them upside down. <laughs> so that's what's, uh, that's what's what. <laughs> so that's telling us our permutation. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to entirely delete that. So that says, um, that says one's gonna go to five now. Actually, I think I, I did have a way to do this where you just do a 180 degree after you flip them upside down. Yeah, there we go. I think that's that. Let's just double check. Let's just make sure. Um, so if I'm turning the front face counterclockwise, one, no, it's not going to five, is it? It's going to eight instead. Did I miss that? No, yeah, that says it goes to eight. Eight goes to nine. Nine. Nine to that's right. I, I, I intentionally put this twist in here because I wanted that song title to come out. See, I, I was going to start singing Missy Elliott oh. when you put it down and reversed it. But I'm going to reverse it. Thank you. All right. The corners, A is going to go to D, D to H. 
H to E and E to A. And that would undo the permutation that F did. Okay. Um, one more, real quick, a half turn on U. Oh, shoot. Um, F prime also does, it does a counterclockwise um, 90 degree turn here. Let me do that. Sorry, I didn't put in a um, 270. I just went up to 240. All right, half turn on you. So now it'll be four two cycles. Four two cycles, yeah. So four edges are going to be permuted in two cycles. So one goes to three and three to one. Four goes to two and two to four. And that's that's the four edges up here. They're all just going exact opposite. And then uh, A, B, C, and D are also doing a, a 180. So A goes to C, C to B. Uh, C to A and B goes to D and D to B. All right, that's one of the prettier um, terms, I think. Could be, it looks like uh, looks like you're going skiing down a snow white mountain. Okay. Oh, we also did a half turn on the U sticker right there. All right, now, now it's time to actually build some algorithms. Let's combine some of these layered twists. So we just saw what each of these pieces do uh, individually, but now we can combine them together through composition. So we can take this sequence of moves and break it up. To, one, to doing one move at a time, but we sequence those permutations um, in order and then follow the movement of the pieces. So, so, F prime so doesn't... in order means left to right? Oh, ah, yeah, actually, yeah. So sing master notation, uh, when we read an alg, yeah, just read it left to right. Okay. Yeah. All right, so the the sequence is if I'm, the sequence we're conveying is f prime u two f. So I can grab f prime I don't guess we need all the everything, but we got extra. We can do U2. And then F. And let's see what effect this has, this should have on the cube. All right, so um, it seems like the centers are, um, let's see, this is gonna get, a, that's a three 90 degrees turns on the front sticker and then another 90 degrees. So it's gonna get a full rotation on the front sticker. The U is gonna, the upper sticker is gonna get half turned, but otherwise everyone's staying in position, All right? Um, this whole block of edge pieces Staying in position, nothing's changing here. Um, same with six and seven, looks like. They're not affected. 
And it, otherwise it looks like three, one, two, three, four, they're all affected at some point and eight and nine are as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy down the edge pieces that aren't affected and the centers. And I know that eventually they're gonna end up right back exactly where they were because they're not really going anywhere. They're not affected by either of these guys. Um, the same thing is true for F and G. You might notice that they're going straight down, turtles all the way down right there. But all the other pieces, all these other QBs are moving along the way. So um, one is going to go to, let's see, eight at first. And then it's going to go stay in eight. Oh, and then it's going to go back to one. How about two? What happens to two? Swaps to four eventually. Goes to four and then stays in four. Three? One to five. Four? Two. I like this. this is like Plinko, right? You just got to follow it down. Here. Oh, gets fixed. And nine. That would be as well. Yeah. All right. And now let's look at the corners. Straight down, over, and right here. Okay, sorry, we need to line these fellows up. Here we go. All right, so uh, what happened here? What's the net effect here? Where did two end up going? Two and, two and four swap and three and five swap. Two and four. And then three and five, you say? I'm going to use a different pen color. Yeah, so three went to five and five goes to three. And then in the, everything else a, stayed the same? Yeah, A and B swap. And C and E swap. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. And if we actually like get on the um, get on the the scrambler or the um, simulator here, we can just carry this out. I'm going to do F prime U two F, and we can look at the cube and notice what happened. Right. Like this whole big chunk of three blocks and this whole big chunk of three blocks they swapped places with each other and then these two little this little edge piece right here swapped with this one over here and vice versa that's from that half twist on you switch that again so f prime lifts that one edge up and then a half turn swaps it completely out and then F drops that back down, but it's a different edge now, like a whole three blocks together. And so those two corners from the back went down here to the front, and then the, the two corners from the fr front went up to the back, and then the, the edge from the front and back swapped, and then those two edges on top swapped. So if we look back at the key um, where those pieces are, let's see, what was it? 
two and four swapped. So here's four and two. That's those two on top. And then three and five also swapped. Here's three back here and five is up here. And then A and B swapped and C and E swapped with each other. All right, so we get these two disjoint two cycles um, from this F prime U2 F algorithm. Okay, I need to hustle. All right, so um, I was gonna, at this point, I was gonna do kind of like a demonstration showing you like some scrambled, um, like a scrambled cube, what ends up happening yeah, like as you try to intuitively solve it. Um, and typically the first layer is pretty straightforward. You can do it intuitively, but it's not trivial, right? Um, so the hard part about solving a Rubik's cube is that you must temporarily mess up whatever you've already solved. Like no matter what you're doing, in order to fix something else, you need to mess up what you've already done, almost always. Um, so typically you'll, you'll do some scenario like this. You'll move A, you'll do move A, and that'll fix a piece. It'll put it in its right position, but that might mess up some other pieces that you've already fixed. And then so what you do is you temporarily do this second move B to get that, a, that, to get that first piece out of the way, and then undo the first move you did to fix the stuff that you messed up the first time and then undo the second thing you did. And that puts the piece back in its place. And that structure you might recognize as a commutator and, and, we, and we can notate it A, B, A prime, B prime. So that's our general idea here. So let's build a commutator. Um, and actually, I just wanna see like on the cube, I'm gonna hit, I'm just gonna refresh that page and then just carry out the algorithm and we can see the net result on the cube instead of doing the composition. All right, so M E M prime E prime is our first commutator that we're gonna do. And what happened? A three cycle or maybe two, three cycles. Yeah, so there's a three cycle there and there's a three cycle on the back. And if we went through that same um, process that we did just now, like doing the composition of each of these layer moves and traced each piece moving throughout that composition, it would do two disjoint three cycles on the centers and all the edges and corners would end up correcting themselves. They would fix themselves back. Um, so one thing to notice here um, of why that's the case, I'm gonna um, undo this so that was, Okay, so M is this slice that goes up and down toward us, and E is the slice that goes side to side toward us. Um, and so when, when we twist both of those layers at the same time, we can kind of see that their intersection is that one centerpiece on the very front. Otherwise, they're not affecting the same edges, and neither of them is affecting the corners. So the corners actually never permute during any of this um, algorithm. Let's see. But when we undo them in the reverse sequence, we see that um, those center pieces, those center stickers get permuted around in a three cycle. So in that case, up went to front, front to, um, to right, and right to up. So that would look like this. And then it's kind of funny. Um, so the back sticker came to left and the left sticker goes down. Uh, and that's actually like anti-clockwise to whatever cycle you get um, you get on the front. So I think back went to left, left goes to down. All right, so that three cycle, uh, those two disjoint three cycles are the net effect from, um, from this permutation. Okay, so um, a, a useful thing to have in your pocket when you're, when you're trying to build some of these commutators with more complex parts. Um, so, some of these, uh, some of the parts of this structure, A, B, A, A prime, B prime, can be uh, complex themselves. We call those 
Like, so if A was itself a sequence of moves, we would call that a sub-algorithm. Um, and a good way to find the inverse of a sub-algorithm is to think about the socks and shoes. So, um, oh, sorry. I just realized I'm not like animating this. Okay. No, that's not good. It's a really impressive live PowerPoint thing. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, oh, back up. All right. So if you wake up in the morning and you put on your socks, then you put on your shoes. Uh, when you get home in the evening to undo that process, you undo it in reverse. So you take off your shoes and then take off your socks. Um, so we can we can practice this uh, on say this sequence of moves right here. If we do L prime F u prime l f prime in the morning when we get home in the evening what are we going to do to undo that sequence of moves fluffle <laughs> you said fluffle yes with the primes on the uh, other ones on the what second and fourth ones Nice. Yeah, so go in reverse and undo each of those step by step. Now I call this um, this sub algorithm, I call it Philippe, uh, the effect that it has on a um, the permutation that it creates is um, we just saw that one. That's the net effect of um, F prime U2, F, sorry, I'm going a little fast because I'm really tight on time right now. Um, so this is another sub algorithm that's super helpful. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to triage right now. So, um, so one thing so, that, that, yeah, sorry. I have a question. The, the, so the, this makes sense to me where I choose the moves because I want, and I can maybe predict the thing. The thing I don't have any idea how to do is how to look at it and decide which of those things would be useful to you. Right, right, yeah, so Maybe yeah. that would be a, the most important one for me. Okay, all right, so, um, so it might, uh, yeah, see, I, I think uh, this is the double-edged sword of trying to make this thing more discovery, um, is that I could like point you to, to like, oh, here's a sequence of moves that does this thing. Um, what's, what's most helpful is to focus on the intersection of a given sub-algorithm. So maybe if we just focus on the one that we just did and build a commutator out of this and just see one really uh, salient example, and okay. then um, maybe I'll leave it as exercise for the reader to do the parts that we were gonna do in breakout rooms. Um, if that's the, I think that might be the thing that's like best for time. Yeah, so well then. Okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is with virtual cube and screen and um, and this algorithm uh, right here, I'm going to carry out each part of a commutator comprised of A and B and then A prime and B prime here. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll notice which what part of the intersect, what, what part, what subset of the QBs each of these sub algorithms is going to affect, and then connect that to why it's permuting the pieces that it is on the cube. All right, so, so here's F prime um, U2F. That's the one that we just saw. It does that big block permutation there and there. And then, so that's the, that's the, that'll be the first part of our commutator. Then the second one will be E. So that just slices the equator straight across. Let me undo that again so we can see that kind of in slow motion. E is gonna move. So we just put this three block here and E is gonna move that, that edge piece out of the way. And it inserts a different edge piece here. And now A prime in this case is actually uh, serendipitous that we picked this one because it's its own inverse. If we undo this in reverse order, since U2 is order two, it's gonna be its own inverse. So we're gonna do F prime 
u to f uh, is also the inverse of that a. So f prime u to f will fix those three blocks back. So it permuted those corners and those four edges. Um, and now it fixed those corners and, four, and three of those four edges back. So these two edges on, on the upper face swapped back with each other. And this edge came back down here. But looky here, that wasn't there to start. Um, I'm going to undo that real quick. And we'll see why. When we did the uh, equator slice, we inserted this piece into that position. All right, so when we lift, half turn, and drop it back down, the piece that we inserted there is now back over here where the orange and yellow piece started. And the orange and yellow piece is way back over here. So then to complete the commutator, we'll undo B. That's since B is just the equator, we're just going to undo the equator. So that's lowercase e here. And now all the, all the things that B messed up the first time we did it, we just fixed back, except for the things that intersected with A. So A was affecting this set of QBs right here. It did E and C. It permuted those with each other. And A and B permuted with each other. And then it also grabbed, oh, there's E. It grabbed five and swapped that with three. And it grabbed two and swapped that with four. So that's the QBs that are affected by A. And if we, and we mark the QBs affected by B, well, that's only the things that are on the equator. Oops, sorry, let me undo that. Let's use blue. All right, Brian, so this is to get to your question, right? So like, how, how do we know like what, what a, an algorithm that we build is gonna do, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if we, if we take two small chunks of layer moves that we know pretty precisely what their permutation is, and attend to just the, just the position that's at the intersection of those two pieces, then we can see, gain some insight into, oh, I think I'm, um, into what effect that algorithm's gonna have. I had a physical copy of this cube somewhere and I don't have it. Um, so the, the intersection of these two sub-algorithms is just that five position right there, that Q is in that five position. So the first thing that A is gonna do is it's gonna swap three and five with each other. E is gonna put six in place of five and it's gonna move five just out of the way temporarily. A prime, now six is in this position. A prime is gonna put that back up here with where three started. And it's gonna put five back down here. And then E prime is gonna move those guys back. The, the pieces that aren't being affected by both algorithms are scrambled by the first part of their sub algorithm and unscrambled by the second part. Only the pieces that are affected by both of them will, will end up getting permuted here. The intersections are what's really what what is really critical here. Um, so the same thing's true here. Uh, I'll just go ahead and mark for this sub algorithm. If you actually carried it out on your cube or on a on a virtual cube, it would the B sub algorithm would affect just this set of QBs right here, and L. Oh shoot, I labeled. I did that wrong. Sorry. It's It's these here, I'm sorry. So B is only gonna affect these QBs here. And L is going to affect only the ones on the left layer. So that's all these. 
And all you have to do is attend to the one that's at the intersection of those two. That's D. And the pieces that occupy D are the only ones that are going to be end up being scrambled if you build a commutator out of this guy. Because L will L will twist a whole bunch of things, but only the things that end up in this D position will be affected by B. So B will put somebody else in there and, and it, it actually ends up putting A in this position. And then when you undo L, it fixes everything that's just in pure blue and actually like unfixes, like it puts a, a piece into here where it's, that started here and then undoing B will fix all the things that's pure yellow and the piece that's in there, it'll like whichever one it started at, which in this case, it turns out to be this guy. So those are just the three pieces that ended up getting permuted there. And I can show you that one actually. I do know that I have a physical copy of that one here. So, um, so here goes. Okay, I don't know if you can see me now. I think the camera's pointed upwards. It's a nice ceiling though. Do I need to turn the camera around? Maybe there. There you go. There we go. Commutate the ceiling in your office. <laughs> okay, sorry. So this is that QB there. Um, so the, the first sub algorithm L is just gonna permute these blue and this one green piece by doing that. And then when I do the B sub algorithm, that's gonna be R prime, U prime, R, U, it swaps these two guys with each other. Then L is gonna push this yellow one back up and it's gonna put the green one in this back in its original position. And then undoing the second part is gonna swap these two back. So this looks like it started here, but this was actually, if you remember, that was green first, this was yellow and now it's green and that was blue and now it's yellow. Um, so that's, that's really what's going on. It's like the things that, are, that enter that intersection of those two sub algorithms are the stuff that's gonna commute. So yeah, I think that's um, killed my time. Well, it reminds me of like dynamical systems or ergodic theory or something. Cause it's, it's not just like the intersection of those colors, it's which things pass through there at a given time. So you have to really, like you seem to like know in your bones, which ones get swapped with which ones for some of these basic moves. Um, no, I mean, honestly, like I'm, I'm just now really getting the, the permutation um, these kind of permutation notations like sussed out. Whereas before it was like, I just knew that the sequence would do a thing and I could apply it. Um, if you, it, it, I, I said, I would leave this as an exercise to the reader. If you go through each of the breakout rooms, you'll end up with five commutators um, and they will accomplish exactly, I have a picture of them at the very last slide. Those, um, commutators will accomplish exactly uh, these permutations, <laughs> these four permutations on the cube. Um, and that actually ends up giving you complete control over uh, the cube within its mechanical restraints. Well, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. So, so the idea here is that you, you somehow create these commutators that allow you to put any QB in any place in any position yeah is that okay and then you're done yeah i mean like then it's a matter of like deciding what you want to do with them uh there's a little bit extra on um you know so so you it's it's it's, it's important to like orient the cube and which cubies you want in the three positions where you can permute so there is a little bit of work to structure on the front end and uh, that's what I put on this slide here. I didn't talk about conjugates today, and those are critical for being able to set up the pieces into places where you can permute them in productive ways. Um, otherwise, you're only just permuting the same three positions all the time, and 
um, that's not productive. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we need to uh, wrap up our recording. So I'll do my very still screen share briefly. Um, so we had a lovely talk this week about uh, cube algorithms. Next week, we have Lucy Rykoff Smith uh, zooming in from across the pond, talking about proto pies, about pie charts and not pie charts, and why they're hard to think about and uh, hard to understand. So can everyone please join me in thanking David Masco for this very interesting talk about how to think about room schools. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I have to run, but some people to academic senate, but maybe some of you want to hang out. So great. Thank you, David. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brian. Take care.